All right, thank you all for coming. We have our disclaimer screen. I'll get started with that. My name is Abby Zarnecki. I am the Southern Region Angler Education Coordinator for Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, I am just going to moderate tonight and let Travis Hawk, Mike Curtis, and Jan Nemec take over the awesome show tonight with lots of trout information. Um, so your camera is off, you're automatically muted. Um, if we don't have too large of a group tonight, we will um, unmute you and let you raise your hand to ask questions. Or if you think of an awesome question while they're talking, go ahead and put it into the Q&A box and we will hold it there until we open it up for questions. Um, and then uh, to create participation from you guys, the audience, uh, we will also have the chat open throughout or I will put little um, references to what they're speaking of or email addresses in that for your information that you can copy down as well. Um, so thank you so much for enjoying our conservation education program. And this is a PG program, make sure everything is on topic for trout tips and tricks. Um, or anything fisheries, we pretty much can get you covered there. Um, just no profanity, inappropriate behavior. Um, and that way we don't have to remove anybody. That's it. All right, and uh, we are recording just to let you guys know too. So that uh, the comments do show up on that and it will be on YouTube probably by the end of next week. So nice to see some familiar faces and we'll get going with this. All right, so if you guys wanna introduce yourself, I will mute and let you guys take over. Thank you, Abby, I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I am Jan Nimick, uh, Angler Education, Western Region, uh, just like Abby, uh, but in the Western part opposed to the South. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit tonight about some of our um, urban ponds and kind of what's going on with that. Um, we have two other uh, very special guests. Um, Travis Hawks, I know, it's a big opening. <laughs> uh, Travis Hawks is uh, one of the Western Region uh, fishery biologists, specifically uh, over the truckie, um, the baby. So um, I think he's going to speak a little bit about that and some specifics on the on, uh, why and how that fish is uh, so good in the fall. And we'll call him the very, very special guest, uh, Mr. Mike Curtis. Um, we brought a guide in, um, you know, we've got Travis, he's the smart guy. Um, and I don't know where I fall in the, the group, but uh, Mike is definitely the one that catches more fish than anybody else. So uh, he definitely needed to be a part of this. Although Travis definitely catches plenty of fish on his own. Um, <laughs> definitely plenty of fish. Um, so I guess uh, unless you guys have something to say, uh, let's get rolling. Yeah, no, I'm good. Ready to go. All right. How about the first slide, Abby? So tonight, um, again, I, I kind of repeat what I just said. Uh, we talk a little bit about the urban ponds and, and where to go right now to, to get into fish easy. So for, for kids, um, and for, for anybody that's just getting into it, uh, we'll talk about those. And then again, talk a, lot, a little bit more about specifics. Travis will cover uh, the where and whys on, on that. Uh, next one. All right, so urban ponds. Um, real quick, just kind of start from the beginning. Urban ponds um, are, are little oasis in the neighborhoods, the cities, um, the desert really. So, you know, we don't have a lot of um, water to fish here. So our urban ponds provide um, fishing access to those that ordinarily wouldn't have it. Um, so uh, we have a, a lot of unique urban ponds um, in our state, specifically Western region, um, just, about, just about every corner um, until you go way, way up towards Oregon. We don't really don't see an urban pond, but just about everywhere else, everywhere else we really do. Um, southern region as well, um, there's, there's quite a few urban ponds, um, especially as we get into winter, we see fishing kind of turn on down there. Um, but again, the urban pond is, is an oasis in the desert. Um, why do we have the urban ponds kind of touch base on that? Um, it's really just to get um, individuals that don't really have a chance to, to, to get out fishing as much as, um, as they'd like. Uh, being far away or not having the, the ability to, to, to get away or um, whatever it may be. Um, so really just providing that space to, 
to, to fish um, in those neighborhoods again in cities and where they're kind of uh, kind of out of place. Um, the urban, uh, urban ponds um, are maintained um, in the Western region uh, really, really well. Um, well being, um, they're, they're stocked pretty well. So we have uh, quite a few fisheries. Again, um, I'm gonna speak to the Western region. Um, we have uh, Sparks Marina, um, kind of just even talk about some, some numbers. Um, we've, the, over the last four weeks, we've had uh, quite a few uh, plants in our urban fisheries. So um, again, Sparks Marina, I think saw about 4,000 fish in the last four weeks. Um, I think that was pretty close, maybe closer to the, the first part of the month, but again, real recent. Um, the Verdi ponds up at Crystal Peak Park um, have seen uh, about 800 fish. Um, Wilson Commons, uh, the pond there um, out in Washoe Valley uh, has actually seen a couple plants um, in the last uh, month. And that's uh, just about a thousand fish between the two. Same with Maryland's pond. So um, before that one freezes, definitely a good idea to get out to that one. Um, Bailey Pond down in Carson City, uh, same story, a couple, uh, couple plants in the, about in the neighborhood of a thousand fish. Um, Mountain View Pond, Yearington, uh, kind of the same story. Um, stuff coming up. Um, the winter fishing urban ponds in the southern part of the state. I think about Thanksgiving, we start to see some of uh, the trout going down there. So um, certainly um, worth getting out. Uh, some, I guess, tips that I have for the urban ponds. The fall is pretty, I don't want to call it easy fishing, but it can be very, very good. Um, the key with the urban pond, or excuse me, urban ponds is definitely uh, small hooks, uh, light leaders, um, and um, I'm pretty big on uh, bobbers right now. So fishing salmon eggs under a bobber on super light tippet, um, like four pound test, um, light, light stuff is definitely um, definitely key right now. Um, but again, they're, they're pretty loaded with fish. Um, so it's, it's certainly worth getting out to one of those. Um, if you don't have a chance to get out. Uh, coming up, uh, stuff to look forward to, I guess, in the wintertime. Um, our, our fisheries that, that, the urban fisheries that we do uh, fish a little bit in the winter. Uh, Sparks Marina is definitely one of them. I, I said, or touched there in the beginning, they saw 4,000 fish. Uh, we definitely put uh, more fish in this urban fishery than I think any other. Uh, Travis probably know for sure on that one, but uh, this gets a lot of fish for sure. Um, and in fall, it, it, it does fish good. Um, it definitely does fish good. Um, and will continue until it gets real, real cold. But this is one you can hit uh, just about all winter. And next slide. I think this is Travis's spot to take it away on the uh, important scientific stuff. So uh, if you don't mind, sir. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jan. And like you said, um, my name is Travis Hawks. I'm the regional fisheries biologist for kind of Western region. I cover Tahoe Basin, the Truckee River, and then a couple of smaller reservoirs um, north of Reno, all the way up to the Oregon border. Um, and so I'm kind of right now going to talk more about Truckee River specific stuff, um, since it's kind of in the greater Reno, Reno Sparks area. And it's a pretty popular fall fishery. It's super productive. Um, so I'm just going to go over the reasons why it becomes so productive and and really um, the, the fish behavior, what, what is making these fish get more active in the fall. So um, first one is really just the water temp and the flow. So, you know, all, all summer long, you've got those fish um, basically hunkered down. The, the water gets pretty warm. Fish don't want to expend a lot of energy. So they'll mostly be sitting in some of the deeper water. They'll be sitting kind of right behind riffle sections in, in some deeper pools where there's more oxygen and they don't have to expend a lot of energy to feed or, or really survive. And it's kind of a stressful part of the year for them. And then as you go into the fall and those water temps start to cool off, fish become more active. Um, some of them are actually trying to recover from losing a little bit of weight during the summer when they weren't feeding as much. Um, so they, they typically just get more active and really more active throughout the day. So again, in the summertime, your, your peak really activity fishing times are gonna be early morning or real late in the afternoon when those water temps are cool enough for the fish. Um, as you come into the fall, you, 
you know, those water temps stay down pretty much most of the day. Um, the angle of the sun on the water starts to get a little bit lower. So you don't have that big overhead sun shining right down on them, keeping them scared. So they're, they're more apt to come out and be in some shallower water feeding. Um, and then really one of the last things you see as far as flow and temp is in the fall, you've got that, um, the, the flows in especially the Truckee River are at about the lowest they're going to be all year. And so um, a lot of that habitat that was spread out, fish were kind of spread out in the spring, spread out a little bit in the summer. In the fall, that habitat disappears. And so those fish are kind of congregated into smaller areas and you'll, you'll really come across bigger groups of fish in smaller areas feeding. Um, you can find them, you know, on, on seams in the river where they're going to be holding tight. Um, and you typically can catch more than one fish out of a specific area. Um, so yeah, that's all that. Um, next slide. And so then the forage is another one um, that becomes a little more available in the fall. Um, a big thing is that you're going to see those forage species. So what we typically refer to as the endemic or like the minnow species that exist in the river. Um, they're also forced out of that kind of marginal edge habitat that they might be able to avoid predation from the bigger uh, trout species. And as that water temp lowers, those, those uh, minnow species are forced into the deeper pools, they're into the riffles, one to two feet of water, and um, those trout that have become more active because the water temp's cooler are more apt to chase and they're going to, a lot of times they're gorging on those, those minnow species. So, um, you know, so speaking fishing specific in the fall, you're going to get fish that are more apt to actually chase, you know, whatever you're using. So if you're fishing with spinners, if you're fishing with a fly, a streamer pattern, um, those fish are, are more apt to act. They don't have to have that thing float right in front of their face. They're going to come out from where they're hiding and they're going to chase it. Um, you also have, there's some different invertebrate hatches that happen in the fall that you don't see throughout the rest of the year that a lot of fish will key in on. Those invertebrate hatches can happen more frequently throughout the day. So summertime, you're not seeing that stuff in the middle of the day, whereas in the fall, especially on maybe some cloudier days, or if we get a little bit of weather, you'll see some stuff hatching and fish become more active um, in response to that. And then the last one that, um, you know, a lot of people aren't as familiar with is that, I mean, everyone knows what a salmon egg is, but, you know, people aren't as familiar as to why fish are typically eating salmon eggs, but in the fall, you've got some, some species that'll be spawning in the Truckee River, brown trout, uh, mountain whitefish are, are both spawning. And when they do that, you know, they're not all the eggs that they're laying do not end up in what, what we call a red or their nest. And so as those eggs are drifting downstream, um, things like rainbow trout, even other browns and whitefish will be keying in on those things. Um, they're a real high protein source. It's a good way for fish to put on some weight and, and they love eggs. And it's one of the one of the most effective patterns um, to use in the Truckee River. So that's, that's one thing to, you know, try as temps cool off, you get later into the fall. Um, a lot of people are real successful with those egg patterns. Um, okay, next slide. And then um, just behavior in general. So I've, I've touched on a lot of this already, you know, the summer to fall, summer they're hunkered down, not wanting to move a lot. Temps cool off in the fall, they become more active, they're moving around. And then really you've got um, two big ones are the pre-spawn species. So brown trout and whitefish are fall spawners, um, rainbow trout, cutthroat, they're spring. So this is specifically pertaining to the browns and the whitefish, but um, in the Truckee River, they'll start spawning or staging to spawn in kind of early to mid October. And then they'll on, in some occasions go all the way through November with their spawn. Um, before they spawn, they become more aggressive as well. Like we've talked about um, the browns especially will be out and about, the males will be kind of cruising, looking for suitable habitat. The females will be starting to build their reds. Um, and so they can, they can be very fun to fish for that time of the year, but um, there's some stuff you got to kind of watch out for. And I think the next slide, if we go to it, we'll talk about it. Um, yeah, so it's basically you're, you want to avoid a red. So what a red is, is it's a it's what we call a, a fish's nest or where the female is going to lay her eggs. And so a lot of people have probably seen female trout building their reds. They kind of lay on their sides, they kick up the gravel. And what it makes is what you see right there in the picture. It's kind of an off colored section of gravel. The gravel can be anywhere from the size of a dime up to about a quarter. And they'll, 
typically for like brown trout in the Truckee River, those reds will be anywhere from two to four feet. And they're pretty visible. Once you, once you see one, you, you know what you're looking for. Um, if you see one of those, it, you know, it's best to avoid it from an angling standpoint because um, what it is, it's, it's an active spawning fish. Um, and so if you happen to catch that fish and pull it out, there's a number of things that can happen to it. It can, it can dump its eggs in the fight. Um, it, it's going to expend energy it doesn't want to expend. Um, if you release it, it may abandon that red entirely. And so I, I don't want to discourage fishing in the fall. It's just, it's just actively fishing towards a spawning fish is typically not, not something, you know, we'd like to see. Um, so yeah, just, just keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. Um, if you are fishing in a foot of water and you see a couple bigger fish just kind of out in the middle, hanging out in a kind of an odd spot, you know, look upstream of them and you may see the red because they typically sit just downstream of those reds. So um, that's really kind of all I had from a behavior standpoint. I think we have a, a quick show of the Truckee River survey that we actually just completed about a month ago. Um, it was super successful this year. The river's in phenomenal shape. Uh, I haven't had time to work up the numbers, but um, I, I'm guessing average size of both the rainbows and the browns in the river are going to be um, a little bit bigger than we've seen since pre-drought. So um, river's in great shape, but I'll shut up now and let you guys watch. I think maybe. Does it work? on Fishing Nevada, including fishing reports, instructional videos and podcasts, as well as upcoming classes and clinics, find us on Facebook or visit us at endow.org. So you've got a fisheries biologist, um, guy that likes to fish a little bit, and then the fishing guide. Um, so if there's any questions on fall fishing or um, on areas, or uh, I'm pretty sure we could probably tell a story or two. Um, I definitely wouldn't uh, mind sharing my favorite fall spot um, if there aren't any questions. Do fish migrate? Travis, you want that one or <laughs> some? Um. All right, so uh, yeah, um, fish will migrate. Uh, it's kind of dependent on species and area you're, you're, you're about, but in the Truckee River specifically, um, in the fall, you will see um, the browns will, some browns will make a, a decent movement. Um, we're, we're learning more and more about the Truckee River every year. We actually just kind of found out this past year that some of the rainbow trout are actually making up to a 20 mile move, which is pretty impressive in a system like that. Typically, river fish expect them to do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of all new to me. I'm always learning about the river, but I have seen individual browns that I, I we've tagged and we know that they've gone from one area to another and, and moved about a mile. Um, but 
typically the browns and the whitefish in the fall are really not going more than maybe a half a mile to find optimum spawning habitat. The other question is, do fish hibernate? You want me to, okay, I'll go with that one. Oh, I, uh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I can try to answer this one. Yeah, Come on, I mean, Travis, that's like a the, biologist the, question. The, the, right I there. know, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to take everything. Um, so yeah, they My don't. My answer is silly. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't technically hibernate, um, but they will go into a, a state of very, very little activity, um, both in the extremely warm temps and then again in the extremely cold temps. Um, more so when it's really warm. When it's really cold, um, they're still going to be feeding and there's portions of the day where they're doing a lot. Um, but uh, summertime, really warm temps, those fish, as much as they can, will, will shut off and not do much at all. But um, an actual like hibernation state, not, not exactly, no. Yeah. Answer, you got to hit them right on the nose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When they're when 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 they're like that, you have to put it right. When they're in front. cold. Yeah. When they're cold. We have a um, biology student that's been very active with us uh, lately. The fish camp. So we have one more question from them: Are fish cold-blooded or warm-blooded? Cold-blooded. <laughs> yeah, they're they're cold-blooded. They have a a, a single circulation system, so they're. They are kind of dependent on the temperature of their environment. So yeah, they're, they're cold-blooded species. All right, and now we're getting into the, the Las Vegas fly fishing addicts are on here. I'm very excited to ask. I have not seen this in Nevada, but to hatchery, do hatcheries mark their fish by cutting fins? Some do. Uh, when we stock the Truckee River with Lahontan cutthroat trout, they are all fin clipped. Um, the adipose fin is clipped off of them for identification. For rainbow trout, we don't mark them. Um, but if you're familiar with kind of a hatchery fish in general, um, it's fairly easy to tell. They have what's called fin wear. So um, a wild fish has very clean, crisp looking fins. Um, yeah, they're very sharp angles on the fins, whereas a hatchery raised fish, because it's raised in kind of a confined area with a lot of other fish, they, their, their fins get a little bit stunted or warped as they're growing. And so, you know, that's when, when we're doing our surveys and we're trying to identify hatchery from wild fish, it's basically we're just looking at those fins and looking for that dis distortion on them to be able to tell the difference. Awesome. Um, how... Will now having Lahontan cutthroat trout entering the Truckee again affect the fishery? <laughs> That's a, it's a very broad and um, not, not def I don't, there's not a defined answer yet, really. Um, we are, you know, we're, we're excited to have the cutthroat in the system moving up, doing what they historically did. Um, currently they're, you know, they're, Kind of stuck below Derby Dam, and there's a project going on to be able to allow them upstream of Derby Dam. Um, what it means for the angler is that there's going to be a pretty cool um, pr an opportunity to catch these large lake run fish in the Truckee River for a small portion of the year when they're in the river. Um, it, I don't I don't anticipate it being like a year round thing. We're not going to have large cutthroat trout um, existing in the Truckee River all year round. It'll be more of just kind of a springtime thing. And then after those fish have spawned, they're either going to die, um, which is typical of a, a salmonid species, or they're gonna, a handful of them will make it back to the lake every year. Um, but as far as the, the other side of the fishery, the rainbow and the brown trout side, um, it, it may have an impact in those, those short time, that was short period, um, but you know, for the rest of the year, there's still going to be that productive sport fishery of rainbows and browns, and they're going to be in there, and they'll probably benefit from the cutthroat trout, um, just in the sense that there's going to be a lot more feed in the system in the form of eggs, in the form of young of the year cutthroat trout. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't anticipate any negative impacts to the fishery outside of maybe a short-term window where it might get a little tougher to catch rainbows and browns. Awesome. 
Um, what are the best baits to use in Southern, well, these guys, some are from Southern Nevada. So, um, but just for trout in general, I would say, what are your guys' best baits to use in Southern Nevada besides salmon eggs? And then I'll add on depending on what you guys say. <laughs> yeah, I'll let, I'll let my candle part of that. I'm kind of all about, uh, I'm all about the crawlers. Especially southern, because you've got catfish and bass and a lot of those. So, I think I'm all about the inflated worm. That's, I was gonna say that's what we usually use too at Cummins and get the really nice size rainbow trout that are in my profile pictures. <laughs> um, Would you add on, Mike? Yeah, it's. I think like inflated worm does really well. If you want to go artificial. Um, I don't think you can ever go wrong with a Panther Martin. Um, as far as the fly side of me, um, even with a spinning rod and hanging a woolly bugger or a type of fly leech under a bobber and being able to check it out and slowly reel it back in, um, as a kid, like, I used to do it with pistol peats a lot, and that can be really, really effective for those type for those fish. Awesome. I'll stick with some fish questions. Oh, um, Jeff asked about the cutting of the fins because they saw a fish with a large V cut tail, but it seemed out of place for that fish. And it, it, that can be a number of things. Um, it can be a mark from, you know, a, a predator may have gotten a hold of it at one point in time. Um, some fish from spawning when they're actually digging those reds, like we talked about, they'll actually injure their, their fins and it can be a leftover mark from that. Um, I, d I don't think it would, that's not really a man-made, a man-made thing, nothing we would do here in Nevada. Um, but there's, there's just a, a number of things that can cause that in a fish. We'll go on to what are your guys's flies or yeah, more lures or baits that you would recommend or all favorite fall fishing spots. And then we'll answer some more. Mike, you better start this one. <laughs> um, I guess with flies, Oh, favorite fall flies. Um, pheasant tails are really good in the fall. Um, as Travis was talking about, we get a, some of our best hatches this time of year, um, on especially on the Truckee, our micro blueing olive um Bugs are coming off size like super small, 18, 20, 22s. Um, since I've kind of noticed like 2017, the drought, um, we actually get a really good egg laying caddis hatch, um, usually from about noon to about three o'clock that the fish have really picked up on. Um, for other fisheries, you know, most of the time, like the walker, um, we're going to kind of have that same hatches going on that we had in the spring, just the micro sizes of them. So you're looking two to three sizes smaller, generally anything from 16 to 22, 24s for at least on the fly side. Um, lures, streamers, bait fish patterns doing really, really good right now. Um, lures, you know, Rapala's, um, anything cast masters with that kind of flash and minnowy looking stuff to it for the spin guys or should get you fish. Either of you guys want to add on to that? Kind of big on the pheasant tails right now. Size 16 pheasant tail is pretty hard to beat on the river right now. I know, are you fishing smaller stuff, Mike? 18s, 
twenties. I can't see you tie those on. So, 16. um, yeah, yeah, it's I'll throw one on, but like honestly, it's been a weird year, and lately, the last few weeks, like even though there's nothing in the system to look like it, the fish. I've been wanting like a larger pheasant tail, like a size 12, size 14. And that's been a lot more productive than the smaller stuff, but I'm still getting fish on a size 18, size 20 pheasant tail um, behind. It's kind of a toss up, but it seems like they're preferring a little bit more of a target than the smaller stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. And then, I mean, if I'm if I'm gonna like spinner fish, um, Rapalas I really like in the fall because you get those aggressive fish. Um, they'll chase, and I get bored really easy. So I like something that I can be active with all day long. Um, and then if I'm fly fishing um, streamers, uh, depending on where I'm at, you know, I'll, I'll change it up. But um, I really like sculpin streamers for the upper river. And then the lower river, um, just, you know, your typical Clouser minnow seems to work really well. Um, yeah, that's about it. Hey, Travis, I got a question for you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> On the um, stocking the rainbows in the river and the wearing of the fins in the hatchery have you noticed like any holdovers in those fins actually growing back not you know I, I have seen holdover fish there's not a lot um hatchery fish typically don't persist in a wild environment usually for more than a year but we have seen a handful um their fins will they'll recover a bit but you can you know if you know what you're looking for you can pretty well into two to three years past their stocking date you can still pick out a little bit of fin wear or some warping. Um, and specifically, I, I see it in Tahoe because fish stocked into Tahoe tend to live a lot longer than fish stocked into the river. And so I'll get a fish that I know because I have done some tagging stuff on them. I'll get a fish that I know is four years old, came out of a hatchery and it'll, it'll be recovered a bit, but it'll still, usually it's on that big back dorsal fin. You'll get some wear and some, some warping in that fin. So. So we have more biology questions. Um, do fish get oxygen by opening their mouths or their gills? Yes. Um, so, you know, like if they're in like the river environment, you know, they can sit pretty well stationary and that water is flowing. And so their mouth is really always open. If you've ever seen video of a fish underwater, it's, you know, its mouth is kind of opening and closing slowly. Um, and that water is just kind of filtering through. And as that water filters over their gills, their gills are designed to actually absorb the oxygen that's in the water and then continue to flush the water through. So, you know, in a, in a river, they don't have to do much. In a lake, they do have to typically be kind of cruising at all times to, to keep that water moving through their gills in order to take in the oxygen. Awesome. And do fish have eyelids? Um, trout do not have eyelids um, they you know they have a, a like an epithelium layer like a, a moisture layer over them so they're not in direct contact with like the water that's flowing through them but they don't have actual eyelids like what you would what you would consider an eyelid so they're they're always awake basically and then um, one are fish eggs soft on the outside yes um yeah and it, when a fit the minute a fish lays an egg it begins to harden but um it's still like if you hold them in your hands they are very squishy and very delicate um they're they're not you know they're not like it's not like a a, a bird egg or something like that they're they're you can you know they're they're strong you can drop them on the ground and they're not going to break or anything but they're they're squishy and we do have a lot of trout in the classroom videos where we're processing eggs and actually they, uh, I think we have the one on mace, 
no Gallagher fish hatchery where they're egg where they're processing the eggs. So, and you can kind of see that texture and how strong they are, but still soft. Yeah. Um, so back to the fins. Is a way to prevent the fin wear at the hatchery. It's um, it's an issue of of crowding and then being in those. Um, if you've ever seen like the long, they call them raceways, they're long concrete tanks that, you know, the, as they get bigger, they go out into those. Um, it could be alleviated by not how not growing as many fish and keeping as many fish in an, an individual raceway. Um, the problem with that is it's cost wise, it's, it's not as effective to grow less fish in a big area. Um, so, you know, there's, depending on where they're going, what the, what the fish are being used for, um, there is options to, to limit the fin wear. But since most of the fish that are actually all the fish that we grow in Nevada hatcheries are, are being grown for anglers to catch, it's, it's less of an issue. We, you know, we just want people to catch them. So we're trying to grow as many as we can for the anglers. So. Oh, I think, I think someone's muted. Are fish amphibians or reptiles? So fish are actually fish. Um, they are, they're related to amphibians and reptiles. They're actually, all of those, those three, you know, uh, animal types are called chordates. So they're all related in a roundabout way, but fish are fish and then amphibians are amphibians and reptiles are reptiles. Okay, thank you. Glad you were here for that one. <laughs> what do Lahant and Cutthroat trouts really eat? I'll let Mike handle that one because he's uh he fishes for Lahant and Cutthroat pretty regularly. Is it I it kind of blocked the first part. Is it what do Lahan cutthroat trout eat? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it depends on the size of the cutthroat. Um, the smaller fish are more on the invertebrates, the midges, small bugs, small damsels. Um, in the lake and in the river system as they grow because their body needs more nutrients they switch over to a strictly minnow diet with being in pyramid lake it's the two each um coming into the river they switch over to either the red-sided shiner um Tahoe suckers or mountain suckers that are in the system as well as, you know, I've heard of a video being out there of one of the rainbows being behind one of the spawning beds picking off eggs and a big cutthroat came up and ate a 18 inch rainbow. Um, Travis, I don't know if you've seen that or not. I've heard it. I haven't seen the video yet, but it wouldn't surprise me. One of those big fish sucking down an 18 inch rainbow. Um, yeah. And we, yeah, we've, we've, I've sampled large. I mean, all, all the species, rainbow, brown cutthroat that, you know, you, you capture them and they've actually got a, you know, a 12 inch rainbow hanging out of their mouth. Um, and I know, I'm sure you've seen that Mike, a, a ton of anglers, you know, out of Pyramid Lake specifically, we'll bring in a fish that's got a, a another what would be considered big fish hanging out of its mouth. So, well, like I think I was telling Jan earlier last week, I tied up some seven inch streamers trying to target bigger fish in the river system. And I ended up having a 12 inch rainbow and a 15 inch brown eat a seven inch streamer. So um, those fish will go after some pretty big meals. Um, they usually say a trout will eat up to a third of its body size, um, but having a 12 inch trout eat a seven inch streamer, 
I think if they can get it in their mouth, they're going to try and eat it. I actually remember the first survey I was on on the Truckee. One of the browns that was in the holding well was picking off fish in the holding well. Now, do you see that regularly, Travis, or is that was that just yeah. the big brown was <laughs> had like an eight inch rainbow sticking out of its mouth, and it didn't have it when it was originally netted. Yeah, it's it's you will put them in a two foot by two foot holding tank with big fish, little fish, everything. And you would think, you know, they're going through a fairly stressful process when we electro fish for them, net them, throw them in a tank, but those bigger fish, they are always feeding. And yeah, we'll, we'll pull them out and there'll be a fish hanging out of a mouth or we'll be, we'll be going through sorting and you'll, you'll come across a, basically a half of a fish that <laughs> got, got, got picked off by the larger ones, but yeah, they're, you know, they're, those bigger fish are predatory and after other, you know, not as big, but still after bigger fish, it's bang for the buck for them, you know, that they, they can eat one big meal or a whole bunch of little meals. So. We have one more live question. Shual? Uh, my question is, what is the tiniest trout species, you know? <laughs> I would say um, that's kind of a trick question. Brook trout are typically going to be your smallest, um, but being all biology science geek, a, a brook trout is not technically a trout. So um, it's, it's, yeah, it's called a char. So, you know, rainbows, I guess, are fairly small, but they all, all the species of trout have you know, their own kind of subspecies or smaller populations that still get to be very large. It's, it's more habitat and, and region specific um, is what I would say, you know, I, there's not really one that's smaller than all the rest, I guess. What about the biggest trout? So historically, uh, the Lahontan cutthroat trout um, was the biggest uh, recorded and it's it's beginning to show that again um, there's also a species called a taman that lives in Mongolia that um, occupy the rivers there and they get upwards of 80 to 100 pounds in the river environment um, they're a pretty cool fish if you look them up it's taman t-a-i-m-e-n sure are big the <laughs> Yep. Yep. And the, the flies they use for them are much bigger than I think anything Mike has ever used. Um, yeah, they uh, yeah. <laughs> need the whole chicken for the fly. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Travis, do you, we could possibly get there if the pilot peak program, you know, starts getting back to what they're seeing before the 1930s in Derby Dam with, you know, 40 plus pound, 50. I've heard some reports of like the commercial netting guys catching cutthroat that were 60, over 60 pounds in weight. Yeah, the, the documented, the, the actual documented record is like 41 and a little bit. That's what's recorded, but there's if you go back into records, there's a bunch of like anecdotal or stories of people catching them all the way up to about 80 pounds. Um, I have no doubt, you know, if to continue going the way that Pyramid Lake is going, um, you know, it's, it's a stocked fishery right now, but the numbers being stocked into there, those fish, they're long lived fish. They get, they get really old and they continue to grow throughout their life. I mean, I, I have no doubt that currently there's probably fish in there over 35 pounds that people just haven't seen yet. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if continue to go the direction they're going, continue the stocking program. If we do start to get some natural recruitment from the river, um, yeah, you can, I mean, there's no, you know, who knows what the top end is on that species. What are the largest fish you guys have caught? I'll let Mike go first. Um, fresh water or salt water? Well, one of each. <laughs> um, so my 
largest fish overall uh, is a 175 pound uh, black tip shark down in the Florida Keys. Um, my biggest, let's do it this way. My biggest cutthroat trout out of Pyramid Lake right now is about 18 pounds, roughly 31 inches. I haven't landed a fish over 20 pounds yet. That's kind of the new goal for everybody out there at Pyramid. Um, my biggest river fish out of the Truckee River, I have three that tie it lengthwise and that's a 28 inch rainbow and two 28 inch browns, um, all roughly eight, nine pounds um, in there. And that was pre-drought, but it, the way the river's going, we're gonna be seeing a few more of those class fish coming up here in the next few years dan uh yeah <clears throat> so i think saltwater um I, I remember it actually very well it, it was a halibut so there wasn't much to it it was kind of like lifting something off the bottom i think it was in the neighborhood of 90 pounds so it was like two hours of agonizing lifting um so halibut, yeah, in the 90 pound neighborhood um, for saltwater. Uh, the LCT, definitely underused. The Lahontan and Cutthroat out of Pyramid, um, you know, I I've actually only broke the 10 pound mark one time and it was with a 16 pound fish. So I, I fought forever to get over 10 and it was just a few years ago that I finally got, got that one. So I haven't even started looking at the 20 pound mark yet. Um, and I think aside from that, that seems like that 28 inches is like the magic number on the river. Is that brown trout, uh, that is, that's probably my biggest fish on, on the river. Is a 28 inch brown, yeah. But not three, just one. You fit as much as me though. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the nerd again and say that my my biggest saltwater slash freshwater fish because it was a steelhead that, so if you don't know, steelhead is a rainbow trout that lives most of its life in the ocean and then actually swims into freshwater from the ocean to spawn. Um, so my biggest fish was a, a 19 pound steelhead um, that was like 37 inches long. And because he lived in the ocean and the freshwater, that's all I'm going with. I haven't gotten that those big of numbers yet, but mine are both out of Cummins Lake and um, four pound trout. And I didn't weigh the pike, but it was at least, it was about three feet. And that was right before the big excavation. <laughs> it was a pretty good one. It was like, we were there for like maybe 10 minutes. I don't even know how we, didn't, we weren't prepared to be that many big pike in there already yeah. and pulled it right up so that was pretty epic <laughs> what did you catch it on the pike we did that was a while ago the last one had another one recently it was two two feet um it was on a number three meps I want to say the other one was on a spoon. Gotcha. Um, All right. Okay. Oh, one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, on the last page, there was a fish picture, a fish, a picture of a fish head. There was some fuzzy thing on it. Is that alive or is it not alive? And what is it? That's Mike's specialty. <laughs> so that is a fly. And from the looks of it, it's a dry fly. So in fly fishing with what we call dry flies, those are flies that float along the surface and trout come up to feed them 
Um, and the size 14 rubber leg orange stimulator. Stimulator. I, I knew it. Like, I can see it. <laughs> it's not my photo, but I'm a fly nerd. Yeah. Um, so it just to, to look like a small stone fly or October caddis, um, which is a ball pattern we don't really see down here on the Nevada side of the Truckee. Um, but more on the California side, that's a late fall, largest of the caddis fly species, I do believe, um, for that. So. A dry fly looks like it has, it's a blind, <laughs> but does it have eyes? No. So with our dry flies, when I should have Jan talk about this since he's the fly tying guru. Um, but with our dry flies, typically we don't tie eyes into our dry flies and a lot of our subsurface um, nymphs, which is kind of the first, second stage of a bug's life um for fly tying we just don't go into super detail with that um but a lot of our streamers and our bigger patterns we will put eyes in um so that answers that i think that was a good answer you don't want to tie on the eyes because then they won't float that well it makes them sink so the only flies or artificial lures um, that kind of look like that, that have eyes are usually the ones you want a foot or two down because they're just going to drop as soon as they hit the water. Usually bat flies have eyes. Those are my new favorite to me. <laughs> well, this was awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for hosting tonight and being awesome panelists. And thank you for watching everyone and all the awesome questions. Um, this actually ends our After Dark series. So no more seven o'clocks for fish camps. Tomorrow at three and 4.30 are our last two workshops and then we are done for fish camp for this year and we may or may not do one before this we're thinking maybe in the spring we'll do another fish camp or an outdoor camp depending on where um, all of our classes take us <laughs> um, so thank you guys so much um, if somebody wants to reach out to you Mike is that the is your email okay there yes absolutely and then um, endow.org, our emails are all over that and phone numbers. So you guys can call us and email us if you have any questions about anything fishing. Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up.